I'm Jay Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. In this episode, we're going to explore the remarkable power of music and its impact on our lives. Have you ever been going along with your day, listening to the radio or Pandora or Spotify, minding your own business and all of a sudden a song will play that triggers such a powerfully visceral emotional response that you get goosebumps or choked up? And before you know it, there are tears in your eyes. Maybe the memory of when you first got your driver's license and blared the radio in your car as loud as possible, filling you with a feeling of newfound independence or, on the other hand, maybe it was the bittersweet memory of a loved one who's no longer with us and hearing their favorite song. Imagine you're watching the Olympics on TV, or maybe you're fortunate enough to be in the stadium rooting for your favorite sports team and our national anthem begins. When you or the singer gets to the line, oh say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? Do you get a chill? Music is a powerful emotional catalyst for many of us. But how is it that a few notes strung together or sung aloud evoke an emotional response so deep that it triggers those goosebumps or tears in our eyes? Quick digression. Speaking of the national anthem, how many times throughout your life do you think you've either listened to or sung the national anthem? Quite a few, I'm sure. So with that in mind, how many of you know all of the words, and I mean all of the correct words, to at least one of the verses? Did you even know there were four verses to our national anthem? If I were to ask you to write down the correct words to one verse, do you think you'd be able to do so without looking them up? There's a good chance that without the help of listening to someone singing the national anthem, you're not exactly singing all the right words. You're probably fudging the words. And that's probably not something to be proud of. It's our national anthem. So, further digression. Do you know that there's actually a word that means mishearing or misinterpreting a phrase in a way that gives it a new meaning? It's called a mondegrin. Mondegrins are most often created when we listen to a song or a poem and being unable to clearly hear or understand or see the lyric, we take the liberty of substituting a word or several words that sound similar enough and seem to make sense to us. Sylvia Wright, an American author, coined the term back in 1954, having noted that as a young girl when her mom read to her from a Scottish ballad, she misheard the lyric that was laid him on the green as Lady Mondegreen. And so every time she heard the ballad, it would reinforce the name Lady Mondegreen instead of laid him on the green. And the term Mondegreen, or Mondegrin as it became known, has actually become included in many English language dictionaries. Let's take, for example, the well-known Bob Dylan song, Blowing in the Wind, in which he sings the answer, my friends, is blowing in the wind. Interestingly, it seems that enough people have misheard the lyrics to that song that one creative person actually began a website in which she collected mondegrins of all sorts from hundreds of people, and she named that website The Ants Are My Friends, as in The Answer My Friends. And in my own family, we've long been familiar with the idea of mondegrins, even before we ever heard of that word or its meaning. When one of my sons was a toddler, he was confused and frightened whenever he heard the catchy tune and lyric for the commercial for Folgers Coffee. It seems my son couldn't quite grasp the concept of why the best part of waking up would be vultures in your cup. And my late father-in-law lit up whenever he would hear the Billy Joel song, Just the Way You Are. As a longtime business owner and resident of Fall River, he was thrilled to know that Billy Joel had actually written a loving tribute to that city that was so dear to him. The lyrics in question were, I said I love you, that's forever, and this I promise from the heart. But my dear father-in-law, well, he heard lyrics that were more meaningful to him. I said I love you, that's Fall River, and this I promise from the heart. Mondegrins. 
We humans sing and hum despite whether we're in tune or not, and sometime and somehow our brains and our nervous systems are hardwired to distinguish music from just plain noise. And somehow we respond to rhythm and repetition, tones and tunes, as opposed to just plain noise. From a simple lonely melody to an intricate sonata, sometimes it feels like music can speak directly to our heart in a language that we may not know, but somehow our emotions understand. Whether it makes us feel wonderful and carefree or sorrowful and downright depressed. Music undoubtedly makes many of us feel. So why is it though sound waves hitting our ears transfer into palpable emotions that sometimes feel as though they are touching our souls? There have been countless studies about the various effects music has on our lives and why it is that music makes us feel the way it does. From feeling invincibly cheerful in the company of a child's playful song like if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, to feeling a sense of sorrow or melancholy sweep over you when listening to Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water, music can tap into our most primitive emotions. And again, it could be a crisp sunny day, you're in the best of spirits without a care in the world, and then you hear Somewhere Over the Rainbow by Judy Garland and it tugs at your heartstrings. Or maybe Tears in Heaven by Eric Clapton, a song written following the tragic death of his young son who fell from a New York apartment building. And suddenly your eyes well up and your mood has instantly changed from feeling carefree to one of profound sadness. And there probably wasn't any rhyme or reason to the kind of music you loved when you were younger. It may have been based on what you listened to at home or with your friends or when you heard your first live concert or maybe it was based on the soundtrack of a favorite movie. Your tastes may have spanned from Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven to Frank Sinatra's Young at Heart to the Bee Gees and the disco soundtrack of Saturday Night Fever to everything in between. Maybe you've always liked the music of Metallica, or on the other side of the equation, of Barry Manilow, who, for the record, didn't actually write the Billboard topping song, I Write the Songs. Consider this. Have you ever wondered how it is that when you have listened to a particular song on, let's say, Pandora, you're then prompted with recommendations of other songs you might like, as if your musical taste is so predictable that some company or computer that knows very little, if anything, about you can make accurate suggestions about the music you may like to listen to. Well, according to Pandora's chief scientist and vice president of playlists, yes, that is their official title, it seems that something called the Music Genome Product, I'm sorry, Genome Project, was created by Pandora Radio to study different musical attributes in an effort to identify songs according to each of our unique listening tastes. The idea behind this was to have musicians listen to and decode the musical DNA of thousands of songs and then categorize that DNA according to different musical qualities such as meter and tonality. Numbers are then assigned to more than 450 different attributes and then Pandora's computer algorithm goes to work, finding out other songs that match those same qualities. And if you think about it, what we listen to in the morning at the gym or on the car ride in on our cell phone can be very different than the music we listen to in the evening when we're winding down. And somehow these computer generated algorithms weigh in factors like where we are when we listen to certain music to make recommendations about music we might like. Here's a little bit of an unsettling thought. Our musical choices are apparently also used to help predict our individual world views and apparently with a high degree of accuracy. For example, Pandora has a political ad targeting system used for presidential and, congr and congressional campaigns. And although they claim not to look at our individual attitudes towards certain key political issues, their system does run ads for different candidates. 
based on the stations and the artists we tend to like. And because Pandora has asked for our zip code when we first register for that service, they can further tailor political ads to specific districts. And so when we tie all these things together, we end up with a very robust data-driven system that's built on perhaps the most unique data about us that's collected. Not our buying or our watching habits, but our music listening habits. Consider this. We're all born with the capacity to learn to speak any one of the hundreds of different languages that are spoken throughout the world. During the first year of our life, things then began to become a bit more limited as the synapses generated in our brain forge certain sounds while excluding others. And that's called enculturation. It seems that during the first six months or so of our life, we can actually follow the syntax of almost any musical style. And if you play something for a baby a few times and then make any slight change or shift, it seems the baby will recognize that deviation by turning their head. The power we have to process and understand music apparently traces back to our early infancies. It's also been suggested that music is like a stake in the ground. That is, it helps to define who we are as individuals. And it also seems that even as our musical tastes change as we grow older, what we listen to at an early age forever serves as something of our go-to comfort music, much like our favorite comfort foods, because it's so inextricably tied in with our earliest memories. And so, the soundtrack of our lives is created. So why is it that the sound waves reaching our ears transfers into physical reactions, such as a quickened heart rate or tear-filled eyes or goosebumps or, cheer, or chills? Let's talk science for just a moment. There are times when we may deliberately choose to use music in order to impact or regulate our emotions. There are other times when it happens unknowingly. And apparently those music-induced emotions occur more than half of the time we listen to music. There's behavioral evidence of a link between our personality and our emotional response to music. For example, and there's no surprise here, extroversion, a trait typically characterized by positive emotion tendencies. It's been related to a preference for music that, again, no surprise, emphasizes positive emotion. Structurally simple in its composition, lively, and often emphasizes rhythm. And not surprisingly, extroversion has also been related to liking happy sounding music and higher felt emotions when you listen. On the other end of the spectrum, neuroticism, often characterized by more negative emotional tendencies, has been related to higher felt sadness while listening to music. It's been scientifically suggested that the trigger for these physical reactions we experience may be found in an area known as Heschel's gyrus, which is located in the temporal lobe of our brain. I told you, a little bit of science. It's also thought to play an important role in processing our affect, that is, the outward display of our emotional state, as well as our emotions, language, and certain aspects of our visual perception. Some studies have suggested that when we listen to music, our Heschel's gyrus in the brain lights up like a Christmas tree on imaging. Things like changing dynamics in the music or rhythm changes or changing tone trigger responses by that Heschel's gyrus, suggesting that it's the contrast in pulse, the strength of the beat especially, that impact us. If a music is loud throughout without a lot of dynamic variability or contrast, it seems that our emotional experience will not be as powerful as if the composer uses a change in loudness. It's also the change in texture, in orchestral music especially, such as the entry of new instruments that excites our brain. Think of music which begins with just the voice of the singer or a solo instrument gradually introducing new layers of sound like violins or percussion or background singers so that the music seems to build 
from a simple single texture to a full textural experience. We often find ourselves anticipating that building of texture and fullness and can almost feel the greater depth of the experience surrounding us, sweeping over us in the music, enveloping our senses. Some of us, though, are simply wired in a way that we're more likely to be moved by music. That is, we're more apt to tap our feet or begin to tear up or experience chills. And that's because of structural differences in our brains. You may be sitting right next to someone listening to the same music at the same time. Look over, find them sobbing uncontrollably. Meanwhile, the truth is, you're enjoying the music, but with no emotional attachment. We're all wired differently. But why is it that our brains are even wired to appreciate music? After all, does listening to music or experiencing any of these emotional or physical effects have any impact on our survivability as individuals or as a human species? Let me ask it another way. Why is it that our brains function in a way that appears to have no meaningful benefit as a species? We know, for example, that the goosebumps we experience when facing a life-threatening situation actually relate to our fight-or-flight response mechanism. The hair follicles in our bodies contract. Our hairs stand on end when we feel threatened. For our prehistoric and hairier ancestors, it made them appear larger and more menacing in the face of an attack. That had an impact on our survivability as a species. But our emotional response to music, how is that related to our survivability? Well, it appears that listening to music we like causes our brain to release dopamine, often referred to as the feel-good neurotransmitter, something that is, in fact, crucial to our emotional and cognitive functioning and well-being. And that, in turn, may benefit our survivability as individuals and as a species. Speaking of studies, one study from Finland found that we tend to choose our music to achieve one of seven different results. Entertainment, revival, strong sensation, mental work, solace, diversion, and discharge. And of those seven goals, the researchers concluded that the latter three, solace, diversion, and discharge, were intended to enable us to deal with or regulate internally our negative feelings. And here's how those researchers broke things down. Solace is when we're sad and we listen to music to make ourselves feel better understood and less alone. Diversion is when we listen to music to change or distract ourselves from our mood. And discharge is when we listen to music that matches our mood like when we're frustrated in traffic and we belt out a heavy metal or punk song to channel our frustration, or we facilitate some form of emotional release. What's interesting is that men who opted for the discharge method had a tendency to feel more anxious and more neurotic than other people in the study. And it seems that listening to angry music when they felt anger didn't make them feel any better. In fact, it made them feel angrier. And it also seems that in the study, men tended to listen to music that discharges an emotion like anger or sadness more frequently than did women. Here's a thought, returning to the vultures in your cup coffee commercial for a moment. Something most of you probably have long suspected. It's true that advertisers use music to encourage us to buy their products. Our brains really do connect with McDonald's loving it or to the magically delicious tune of Lucky Charms, or to the beat of Kit Kat's Gimme a Break. And by the way, 564 Kit Kat fingers are consumed every second, thanks in large part to its catchy Gimme a Break commercials. There is no question, music sells. Why? Because music tends to linger in our mind and memory longer than the spoken or written word. Advertising music is perhaps one of the most meticulously and well thought out kinds of music there is. Few things can drive an advertising message home like a catchy jingle. Whether listeners love it or hate it, a good jingle will relate a brand name with a concept, idea, or promotion like little else. 
While music and radio have been around for hundreds of years, the first singing commercial jingle is thought to have aired on Christmas Eve in 1926 for General Mills Wheaties. In addition to enhancing brand awareness by creating a message that sticks in a listener's memory, catchy advertising jingles create a bond with the listener and provide an almost instant emotional connection to a brand. It's what music does best. It creates an emotional connection. And the right jingle can act like an earworm, becoming a familiar, repetitive sound our brain will store and recall, so that just like with your favorite song, even the opening few notes of a commercial jingle will generate memory triggers. You'll automatically start singing the song or jingle and make the connection with the product. Oscar Mayer, my baloney has a first name. In addition, the idea of music as a comforting agent is nothing new. More than 400 years ago, William Shakespeare said that music can raise out the written troubles of the brain. Elton John said that music has healing power. It has the ability to take people out of themselves for a few hours. And the great Louis Armstrong, jazz trumpeter, once said that one good thing about music, when it hits you, you feel no pain. And he may have been right because music has been shown to ease pain and to improve the outcome of surgical patients. One study from New York examined how music affects surgical patients. 40 cataract patients volunteered for a study. Half were assigned to receive ordinary care. The others got the same care but listened to music through headphones before, during, and after the operations. Before the surgery, both groups had similar blood pressure. And in both groups, average heart rates increased before the surgery, but the patients surrounded by silence found their blood pressure remained high throughout the operation, while the pressures of those who listened to music came down rapidly and stayed down well into the recovery period. The music listeners also reported that they felt calmer and better during the operation. It's also been found that music decreases the need for supplementary intravenous sedation. Slow and meditative music produces a relaxing effect which can lower the listener's heart rate and blood pressure. And many of us know firsthand that music-assisted relaxation can improve the quality of our sleep. Think childhood lullabies and their effect. Music can actually help prevent falls in elderly patients, something one out of every three senior citizens experiences during the course of a year. But how is that possible? In a study of several hundred people, subjects were at risk of falling, but were otherwise free of major neurologic and orthopedic problems. Half the volunteers were assigned to a program that trained them to walk and perform various movements in time to music while the other continued their usual activities. And at the end of six months, the dancers, if you will, experienced better gait and balance than their peers and had 54% fewer falls. Similar programs of movement to music appear to improve the mobility of patients with Parkinson's disease. And those who have been hospitalized following strokes have been found to benefit cognitively and with motor abilities after listening to music. It seems that music may promote the brain's plasticity, that is, the ability to make new connections between nerve cells. And it seems that the synchronization of music with repetitive exercise provides enhanced physical performance as well, helping people work out longer, train more efficiently. Those who may have difficulty expressing their feelings in words sometimes feel more comfortable expressing those emotions through music as well. It has the unique capacity to mirror our emotional lives. Its rhythm and cadence can reflect our spoken languages. Next time you hear someone speaking emotionally, listen carefully to the characteristics of their voice. It may become faster or slower, louder, softer, depending upon their emotion, just as a musical score might. And finally, if you've ever had a pet, has there been a time when you intentionally left the TV or radio on when you weren't home for the listening pleasure of your pet or just to keep them company? We have a very human tendency to project onto our pets many different emotions. 
we also tend to assume that they will like what we like. And the truth of the matter is that although animals actually do share our capacity for music, they march to the beat of a different drum. According to researchers, it seems our cats and dogs tend to enjoy very species-specific music. That is, tunes reflecting the pitches, tones, and tempos that are familiar to their particular species. As humans, we tend to like music that falls within our acoustic and vocal range with tones we understand, and interestingly, at a tempo similar to that of our heartbeats. For example, a tune pitched too high or low sounds unpleasant to our ears. To most animals, human music falls into that ungraspable and unrecognizable category. With vocal ranges and heart rates very different from ours, animals simply aren't wired to appreciate songs tailored for our human ears. Most studies find that, try as we might to get their legs thumping, animals generally respond to human music with a total lack of interest. But that being said, there are actually some composers who have written music specifically for our cats and dogs. One composer sells cat songs online at $1.99 a song through a company called Music for Cats. Dogs are a tougher audience, mostly because breeds vary widely in size, vocal range, and heart rate. Interestingly though, some breeds of large dogs, such as Labradors or Mastiffs, have vocal ranges that are fairly similar to those of adult male humans. So it's possible that those dogs might actually be responsive to music in our frequency range, more so than, say, a smaller breed like a Chihuahua. And it seems that some dogs behave differently in response to different types of music, just like humans do. For example, they show behaviors more suggestive of relaxation in response to classical music and behavior more suggestive of agitation in response to heavy metal music. You never know. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed this and I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn or to create the soundtrack of your life.